This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hello, folks. I've got Kyle here. We're going to be talking about uh, Julian Assange today for this episode. But before we dive into that, I've got two housekeeping announcements. One is a correction. Last episode, I erroneously said that the Frank Fetter who was writing on the Scottish free banking period was the same guy who wrote on capital and interest theory in the Austrian tradition. They're actually different guys. The capital and interest guy is Frank A. Fetter. The Scottish free banking guy is Frank W. Fetter. I saw someone claim that actually it's a father-son thing. I didn't independently confirm that, but for sure they're different guys, so I was <laughs> wrong when I said which Frank Fetter it was last time. Then the other uh, announcement is just to remind you, the Mises Institute has its supporter summit uh, coming up. It's going to be in Oct- on October 10th through 12th, 2024, and it's going to be held at Hilton Head. Uh, so join us for a weekend of engaging talks, networking, and celebration at the 2024 Mises Institute Supporter Summit in Hilton Head, South Carolina. It's going to feature presentations from Lou Rockwell, Tom Woods, me, Peter Klein, and Tom DiLorenzo, among many others. So we encourage you to go ahead and, and book that. Registration is open right now for Mises members if you go to mises.org ss24. Okay, so now for today's topic... Uh, we're joined by Kyle Anzalone from, he writes for both antiwar.com and the Libertarian Institute. So Kyle, you were recommended as the guy I need to get on here to tell us all about Julian Assange. So welcome. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think maybe just before we get into the particulars, I know there's a plea deal and so on, can we just maybe take a step back and just remind people of the general timeline as to, you know, Julian Assange is the the founder of WikiLeaks, and can you just speak a bit about that, and then how did he get originally into hot water with the U.S. authorities? Yeah, so th- this goes back a very long way. In fact, I mean, I was still a child, effectively. I mean, I was in high school, but I think I was about 15 years old when WikiLeaks got started in 2006, and initially they published documents that weren't, uh, it, you know, in the first four years, incredibly important and groundbreaking uh, such as what ends up coming out in 10, what Julian Assange releases, which he got from Chelsea Manning. But in the first four years, they released some documents from a, a variety of countries. But then in 2010, we have the major document release. This includes, I think, most famously, the collateral murder video, where you could listen to American pilots in Iraq joke around and, and make you know jokes as they kill Reuters journalists and other civilians on the ground. But those leads also included the diplomatic cables, So tens of thousands of documents there that are incredibly important to understanding how the U.S. empire works. You know, just one, again, uh, of thousands of examples is the net means net memo is here. And this is something that William Burns, who was then an assistant to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, is now actually CIA director, wrote at the time to Condoleezza Rice a letter that said that Ukraine joining NATO was the brightest of all red lines, not just for Vladimir Putin, but for all Russians. And that memo has really been a cornerstone of, uh, you know, people who have tried to help the world understand why Russia invaded Ukraine. That memo is entirely important. So it's not just about the Iraq and Afghan war logs, which were also released at that time, and the Guantanamo files, which detailed how America rounded up so many innocent people and people they knew were innocent and threw them in Guantanamo Bay including some children who were minors and, and tortured them, a lot of them you know, either being killed or committing suicide under suspicious circumstances. So there was a lot released by WikiLeaks there, and that really is what gets Julian Assange in hot water with the U.S. government. So Can, can 20- I stop you for a second, Kyle? So Absolutely. big picture, again, just I think there's probably lots of people who have heard of this stuff, but they didn't kind of get into or maybe just because of their age, like you, like you, maybe they were you know fairly young when this first thing, when this thing first took off. And they just never really got so. So the basic premise of WikiLeaks was, we've got this way of we're a, 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 a journalistic outlet. People around the world, and it, it's not just for governments too, like like corporate insider, you know, whistleblowers who have some sensitive things about, hey, my company's doing some shady stuff, and I want to tell the world. And maybe the the people they're afraid to, they don't know who to give it to. Like if they go to a conventional. A newspaper or something like maybe those people aren't going to run it and they're going to tell their boss and they're, you know what I mean? And so 
they don't know. So the the whole the the point of WikiLeaks as an institution, right? I just want to make sure that you know people get that is to say this is a, a you know thing that will be trusted, and they vet the information too. Because I saw lots of people say, "Oh yeah, they just they just print anything." Well, no, my understanding is that you know Assange and his team, you know, they knew that this whole project, you know, sinks or succeeds on the accuracy of what we end up posting. And if people give us something that ends up being bogus and we put it out there for the world, that will look badly upon us. And so they actually, they wouldn't just blindly post stuff and say, well, someone handed us this document, so we're putting up. They would try to vet it themselves to to make sure this thing really is authentic before they would go ahead and post it, is my understanding. Yeah, absolutely. And WikiLeaks has a 100% track record on that. And you're you're all absolutely right, too. And I should have started there, which is what WikiLeaks initially did was invented this uh, software or whatever kind of program that allows leakers to upload documents to WikiLeaks without getting caught. So Chelsea Manning get, ends up getting caught because of somebody she told outside of WikiLeaks. It wasn't through Julian Assange that she ended up getting busted. And now the New York Times and Washington Post and all the mainstream outlets use a very similar program to what WikiLeaks initially um, came up with. I think Aaron Schwartz invented it for and came up with it for WikiLeaks. But yeah, that, that again is the basis. So uh, yeah, where do you want me to pick back up then? Okay, so, and also too, I, this is obvious to you, but just so people, you know, this isn't um, something that they're, they're experts on. This is different from... Uh, uh, Edward Snowden and Glenn Greenwald and all that. So the, those the guys, they didn't use WikiLeaks, right? Correct. Now, Julian Assange did help Edward Snowden get from Hong Kong when he was on his way to either Ecuador or somewhere else in Central America. And the Obama State Department ended up stranding him in Russia. So he did play a small part there, but he wasn't involved at all in the transfer of the documents to uh, Glenn Greenwald or anyone else. Okay. So... Back to, you know, now the main thing. So WikiLeaks had been up and running. They were running stuff, as you say. You know, that was always their go-to when when people would castigate them about, oh, you guys just published stuff. They would say, no, we we have, there has not been a single documented example. And it sounds like you're saying this is still the case of someone pointing to something that WikiLeaks published that later out turned to be bogus. That no, everything they've they've published thus far, no one has proven it to, to be bogus. Um, and so... They were up and running. It wasn't a big deal to anybody. But then the thing that was explosive that got them in the crosshairs of the U.S. government were the documents that Manning turned over, including, among other things, just repeating what you said there, the the footage. Can you maybe just explain a little bit more about what that um, the, collet- the so-called collateral mur- murder video was? Because I think that was probably the most visceral thing that any average American could see that and say, is this real? If that's real, this is not good. Whereas the the diplomatic cables and things, I realized that was also very embarrassing and got the U.S. government in trouble with a lot of, you know, other governments, but the average person reading those might not have understood the implications, whereas that video, you know, was pretty straightforward. And someone saying, if that thing is legitimate, that's, I didn't realize my government was doing that. Right, absolutely. And, and, you know, as you point there, the diplomatic cables, there's thousands of stories across the globe that reference those files, and there's really important information in there. But The most visceral thing from all those leaks was the collateral murder video. Now, somebody who goes and looks that up today might be, I don't want to say like unsurprised or unshot or something because Mm -hmm. of all the very high definition footage we are able to see of the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. But at the time when this was first uploaded, I remember like everybody just being shot by how graphic the content was and and uh, just how detailed it was and how, you know, these operators could clearly see people milling around on the ground. I think they were in an A-10 and decided to open fire on them and then were extremely callous and joking about the deaths that they caused. You know, a lot of people were killed, including a Reuters journalist. And so initially this was denied that it happened by the Bush administration. So that was, you know, an extra level of egg on their face for the American government. But yeah, as you said, at the time, this was extremely shocking and caught everybody's attention because it was some of the most detailed and graphic war footage that people had seen up until that point in time. Yeah. And again, um, just for people who never saw that it's, it wasn't, I think people could understand, oh yeah, there's mistakes that could be made. And I, I can imagine maybe the U.S. they fired. They thought they were taking out Al Qaeda or something, and it turned out. 
but but no again it was the just hearing the guys i don't know if they were in the cockpit or if they were like talking back to the base but the the americans who were watching that thing unfold in real time and their commentary on it that was also like underscoring like ooh this you know for the american people thinking we're always the good guys when it comes to foreign policy this was not uh really consistent with that image right yeah there was there was really no way to deny it and the pentagon would come out and say oh uh, you're looking at war through a soda straw if this is all you're seeing and you got to look at the whole picture. But for a lot of Americans, this was the first time that they saw a very clear example that we were not on the side of good and justice and democracy in Iraq. And there was something really rotten about the uh, American occupation of that country. Okay, so then, um, so we're at the point. So yes, the, the what, what year did that get posted did, did, again? 2010. Okay, so that's the Obama administration, and then they, what happened? Did they initially just call for the arrest of Julian Assange, or do you, do you have any of the details of, like, the big picture on how that worked? Yeah, so a lot of these files and videos and the Iraq and Afghan war laws, the Guantanamo files, really embarrassed the Bush administration more than the Obama administration, but the Hillary Clinton State Department really mishandled all this. So when Julian Assange got these files, he didn't just you know, as some people like to say, throw them up online where anybody could read them and who knows who's going to take this information and hurt people. And they would say that Julian Assange has blood on his hands. Uh, Assange took these files. He worked with uh, several international outlets, including the New York Times, El Pais, German and UK outlets to publish these documents. And so there was a lot of international vetting to make sure all these were authentic, that they were able to find and locate some of the major stories, and a part of that, they released the collateral murder video. At that time, Assange did offer to work with the State Department to say to the State Department, here are the files we have. Are there any names or information in these files that you think could put somebody in danger? And we would be willing to talk to you about maybe either omitting some files or at least redacting some names. Now, during that time, a reporter from The Guardian effectively published all the unedited uh Afghan war laws online. And so it really didn't matter. But the State Department did have an opportunity to work with Assange on this and didn't. And so after these get released, the Obama administration immediately tries to condemn and portray WikiLeaks as evil. And they use this phrase time after time after time. He has blood on his hands. He has blood on his hands. He disclosed information that put people at risk. Now, during Chelsea Manning's trial, I think this was way in 2015, so years later, the U.S. government did admit that nobody ended up uh, getting harmed, killed, or, or anything as a result of these leaks. Yeah, I mean, even just on the in the wake of the the current announcement about Assange's plea deal, I'm sure you've seen this, Kyle. But you know, it it went viral because he got ratioed, I, I believe, pretty badly. Is that Mike Pence came out to condemn Assange as, oh yes, he endangered you know all these. So I, w what's the allegation even that there's all these undercover U.S. intelligence agents around the world and WikiLeaks was like publishing things that would allow somebody to figure out, you know, put two and two together and realize, oh, this guy that we've been talking to actually is a U.S. asset. And so now let's go kill him or something. Is, like, is that what the the claim was? What we were supposed to be led to believe? It was, a, I think, a little bit lower than that. It's not necessarily like CIA assets or people who were helped involved in high-level assassinations. It was U.S. Army government documents, and so they were just Afghans who did work with the U.S. government. The Taliban didn't end up taking this list and using it as a hit list or anything like that. That that was the worst fear, but, but they showed that that never happened. And the State Department did add to get some people to safety who were named on the list just out of an abundance of caution. Okay. And I, I was reading, you know, your articles just recently on this, you know, talking about Assange being released and so on. And that, I think you said, right, that the U.S., the, the prosecutor basically admitted that, yeah, even though actually we can't point to any actual victim here still, da -da -da -da, like, is that right? Yeah, yeah. The, pro the prosecutor on, what would that have been, Wednesday morning, uh, in the Northern Marina Islands admitted that there was nobody, or Mariana Islands admitted that there was nobody who was a victim of the, the leaks that Assange put out, which was uh, incredible because the then State Department spokesperson, Matthew Miller, came out the next day and said that there were victims of what Assange did. And so the State Department was contradicting uh, the Department of Justice. Okay, so can you maybe now just fill in 
uh, some of the middle period here that for a long time, Assange was like living in a, in an embassy somewhere. Right. And like, as sort of a, to, to, so he couldn't get picked up. Is, do I have that right? Right. So in 2012, Assange, I think it was in the middle of summer, maybe June or July, Assange entered the Ecuadorian embassy in London. And this is because he was afraid of getting picked up and shift off to the United States. There had been a sexual assault case opened against him in Sweden. And initially this was reported in the media as this guy's accused of rape. It, you know, it turns out the allegations are much more minor than that. I think originally the woman just wanted him to get an STT, STD test and claimed that while she had consensual sex with Assange, she didn't consent to him not using a condom. And that was the, the crux of the issue. At the time, Assange has said that he was willing to talk to Swedish investigators in the embassy in London or was willing to go to Sweden uh, to, to address these allegations. He just wanted assurances that he wouldn't then be shipped off to the United States. And I feel like initially the smear campaign against Assange was fairly effective because he was hiding out in the embassy in London. Uh, and people thought, well, why would he not talk to the investigators? Why wouldn't he go to Sweden if he has nothing to hide? And we mm -hmm. found out in 2019 what the case was, and that was the U.S. had an indictment against Assange, and they were waiting until they had their chances to get their hands on them. And once he did, he was placed in a U.K. prison, and uh, from 2019 until just recently, he was in the Belmarsh prison in the U.K., awaiting a extradition trial and an appeals process to the United States. Okay, but hang on. So I I think didn't something happen like to to go from the, you know, he's he's hanging out in the Ecuadorian uh embassy in London and and so the US can't get him in there. And then what what happened though? Didn't like did something break down in in Assange's yeah. relationship with the Ecuadorian government fell apart? So there was a change of government in Ecuador, and the U.S. actually, under Trump, this is, uh, bribed the Ecuadorian government with, a, I think, multi-billion dollar, I think it's $6 billion IMF loan. And then after that, the Ecuadorians revoked Assange's stay in the embassy, and U.K. authorities drug him out and put him into prison. Okay. Now, what do you know? What was the, for the U.K., under what? charge how were the uk authorities holding him like what was he what was his crime so initially they charged him with bail jumping because initially when he entered the embassy in 2012 there was the uh he was one for questioning in connection to what happened in sweden and okay. so they actually sentenced him to the first year he was in belmarsh it was on that bell jumping charge but they were also holding him under an extradition request from the United States government, and that was for 17 counts of violating the Espionage Act. And I should mention here, because I think this is a really important point of the whole uh, saga of why the Trump administration ended up, you, you know, going through, through such lengths to get Assange out of that embassy. And in 2017, WikiLeaks published the Vault 7 documents, uh, and these were considered the crown jewels of the CIA and NSA and their hacking abilities. It got into that they could hack into people's cars and, you know, force them to accelerate or stop or that they could hack documents and then make it look like Russia or another enemy country had those documents. So there were really, really important documents that were released through Vault 7. And at the time, Mike Pompeo was CIA director, and this was incredibly embarrassing for the CIA. And so it was for this reason that they worked so hard to have him arrested and placed in Belmarsh. Okay. So if we could just speak a minute, so it's a little bit weird that, you know, the, the, I think Pence called him a traitor and other things and all these, oh, he's, he's not an American citizen. And so it's a bit weird to be say like, oh, the, why is this guy such a bad guy is because some American serviceman gave him a bunch of documents showing the U.S. government was, you know, very, lying and stabbing people in the back and then literally, you know, blowing people up and joking about it. And this guy had the audacity to to print that information that showed some government that wasn't even his was doing, you know, violating international law. And then all these American politicians are calling him a traitor. Like, that's just weird to me. Um, but beyond that, like, even the Espionage Act itself, I don't know, Kyle, if, if you know these particulars, but I was just wondering, like, like how can the U.S. government prosecute a foreigner, you know, for, for doing something? And, and apparently... The original act uh, 
only pertained. So it, I'm just trying to find it here in the Wikipedia article that it was, um, it, it was, it was amended. Here we go. In 1961, Congressman Richard Poff succeeded after several attempts in removing language that restricted the act's application to territory, quote, within the jurisdiction of the United States on the high seas and within the United States. He said the need for the act to apply everywhere was prompted by Irvin C. Scarbeck, a State Department official who was charged with yielding to blackmail threats in Poland. Okay, so again, it's the uh, this thing was the Espionage Act of 1917. It was originally a World War I item, and the point was, you know, whether libertarians agree with this or not, I guess they don't agree, obviously, but the idea being, if you go and read Woodrow Wilson's commentary as to why we need this thing from a couple of years before to push for it, it's, oh yeah, there's, you know, like U.S. German Americans who are sympathetic to the enemy and might be doing, and okay, but to me, that again, that's qualitative. So it looked like, at least the way I'm reading it, that it wasn't until a 1960s amendment that meant the U.S. government could prosecute people, up, you know, not on U.S. territory for violating this this thing. Yeah. So, and as you mentioned there, the, kind of the initial purpose of this isn't to cover up information that's embarrassing or war crimes as was exposed in the collateral, collateral murder videos or the Guantanamo files, but rather was to prevent, say, some, again, like some German American from obtaining where the Americans were going to base or land in Europe or something like that, and then pass like top secret cl classified information to the Nazi government. Right. You know, it was about handing U.S. state secrets to the enemy. And as Ron Paul uh, famously pointed out, if they're going to charge people like uh, Snowden, Assange, Chelsea Manning with the espionage act for giving American to the giving information to the American people, what does that say about who they view as the enemy? Um, you know, that's a really important point in all of this. Now, also, it, there's a really another really important distinction there, and that was up until Julian Assange, the Espionage Act had been only used to prosecute the leakers. And so the U.S. government officials who had swore an oath to not distribute this classified information and to keep it secret and private, mm -hmm. it was only for, you know, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, these were the people who are supposed to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act, not the Washington Post, New York Times, WikiLeaks for publishing that information. Because once it's given to you, then as a journalist, it's within your First Amendment rights to publish that. And that should extend to Julian Assange. But, uh, you know, the U.S. now has a global empire and we enforce the rules of the empire that we wish to enforce anywhere on the globe. And uh, that includes Australian citizens who are in the United Kingdom. Right. Okay. So yeah, I'm glad you brought the, the, the two full distinction. So yes, the, the one issue is there, the U S government is prosecuting someone who's not a U.S. citizen for doing something when they weren't even on U S soil. And so that's, that's one interesting quirk, but then, yeah, beyond that, even U S citizens who worked for the Washington post, for example, you know, they're, they're not, uh, they weren't hunted down for the Pentagon papers. It was only Ellsberg that, you know, for a while there looked like he could be in serious trouble. And so do you know, how did they, was there an argument being made that, oh, WikiLeaks isn't a, isn't a genuine, uh, you know, journalistic outlet. And so this, that's why this doesn't, this isn't the same thing that, oh yes. If, if, in other words, do they say if Manning had handed this stuff over to New York times reporters and they ran it on the New York times, we would, would they have tried to arrest you know, the, the chief editor of the New York times and put them away the way they are with Assange or do, do they ever talk like that? Yeah. So, I mean, they use a variety of just outright lies. The first is they'll say, well, all responsible news outlets, if they have classified information or information that could, you know, put somebody's life in jeopardy, then they'll go to the U S government before it gets published. Uh, obviously the WikiLeaks tried to do that and it wasn't Julian Assange that leaked the information. It was a new, uh, guardian reporter. And so if they really thought that that was the breaking issue, Luke Harding would be the one who spent four years in Belmarsh and not Julian Assange. Uh, a second thing they say is that, well, real journalistic outlets like the New York times and Washington post will write stories and they just don't publish the documents for anyone to see online which mm. is true, but not necessarily a good journalistic practice. In fact, if we look at something like the Discord leads, the Washington Post and New York Times have hundreds of documents 
that Jad Teixeira posted on Discord. And they've only, and publicly, we've only seen a few dozen of those uh, copies. And so that's a, a setback in why WikiLeaks is better. And then they, you know, we'll just say, oh, WikiLeaks throws up anything online, which again, isn't true. They have a very good track record of only publishing true and verified documents. Yeah, I unfortunately, I can't remember. Maybe if I tell you, Kyle, it'll jog your memory. But there was something, it was a guy on, I'm pretty sure it was CNN. It was either that or like MSNBC, but it was one of those. And I think they were talking about the Assange case. This was years ago. And they said something along the lines of, well, yeah, I mean, that's just irresponsible because, you know, they're just throwing stuff up there with no vetting and the... Uh, Whereas, you know, we hear, you know, responsible journalists like here at CNN or what have you, like, you know, we'll read the documents and decide what's appropriate and can safely be shared with the American people or something like that. You know what I mean? Those weren't the exact words, but that was just the elitism and that, you know, we journalists can be trusted to handle these sensitive documents and so forth. But no, you can't just throw it because, you know, the American people can't understand this stuff. You need, you need, like, we have to be a filter. It's almost like, you know, the old, uh, the, the, the stereotype of the, the Catholic priests, you know, like, oh, the people can't just read the Bible directly. We got to interpret it for them or something. Yeah, no, uh, and I'm sure there was a lot of discussion about this on CNN, but the one that comes to my mind is uh, Chris Cuomo. And Dave Smith actually brought this up in his recent debate where he absolutely pulverized that guy on COVID mm -hmm. and a whole range of issues. But one of the things that Chris Cuomo said, it was, you know, we here at CNN could look at these documents and, uh, but you at home, you shouldn't look at them yourselves. That could be illegal. And so, you and know, that's, yeah, it was yeah. Cuomo. Yeah. You just shot. Yeah. That's who it was. But, that's the one I had in mind. But there are other, and I've, I've heard plenty of other uh, people on CNN, Fox News, and all these other outlets talk about how, you know, what really makes journalism is that they'll put these documents into context, right? So it's not that, you, you know, you read the net means net memo, Bob. It's actually that the Washington Post tells you what that memo means. That's mm -hmm. what they think the distinction between real and unreal journalism, which, of course, is really just the distinction of state-sponsored propaganda and real journalism. Okay, so the um, the the the, thing, the recent newsworthy event, the reason you're here is they somehow came behind the scenes to a, a an agreement for a plea deal. So can you just explain, you know, what what the details are there and like where things stand right now with Assange? Yeah. So again, under Trump in 2019, the U.S. Uh, unveiled an indictment against Assange. There were 17 counts of the Espionage Act and a computer hacking charge. Now, there were a lot of problems with this indictment, including it heavily relied on the testimony of a child sexual predator who lived in Iceland at the time and who admitted he was lying to Icelandic media about what he said in the indictment. The fact that while Assange was in the Ecuadorian embassy, the CIA paid a uh, organization called UC Global to spy on Assange's all of his private communications, including what should have been privileged communications with his lawyers and things like that. But uh, yeah, this indictment was issued against Assange. He was facing 175 years in prison. Uh, he was in Belmarsh prison during this time in the UK. It's known as the UK's Gitmo, which is probably an overstatement, but it's it's like a super mad's prison in the United States and being on a communications management unit. You don't get like books to read or, or places, you know, to walk around. You have a I think they said two meter by three meter cell. He was in 23 hours a day. He got an hour a day of sunlight. He had quite a bit of health troubles while he was in this prison. Uh, he had a shoulder issue that was pre-existing. He has some autoimmune disorders. And so he, he needs a pretty specialized diet. And then uh, also they told him that he had HIV falsely while he was in that prison. So, you know, that was just, I think, a part of the psychological torture they were exacting on him. While he was at one of the hearings for his extradition trial to the United States, he suffered a mini stroke. And so the there was a lot of health concerns for Assange, particularly when we're talking about 2022 to 2023. And then we start hearing rumors that the Biden administration is working on a plea agreement with the Assange team. And it seemed like that was actually not going to go anywhere or move forward. However, in the past few months, the Biden administration has had a couple setbacks in the UK courtroom. And I mean, how much of the UK court case do you want me to go over? Because it stretches from 2019 all the way up until just last week. 
I, yeah, I mean, I think if you can do it in a somewhat succinct fashion, that'd be good for the listeners. Okay. So, yeah, the U.S. is applying for this extradition uh, of Assange on that he violated the Espionage Act, and his lawyers argued against this in the U.K. court on a, a number of grounds. The First Amendment should apply to Assange. He's not an American citizen, uh, that he would face the death penalty in the United States for the Espionage Act, but also that American prisons are just so cruel and inhumane Somebody like Julian Assange, who has depression, he's on the autism spectrum, and he has the, all these other underlying health issues, it would essentially amount to a death sentence. And so the initial judge actually ruled against the extradition of Assange to the U.S. on the grounds that it would uh, put his health in, into greater jeopardy, that he would likely either die or kill himself in an American prison. And so they didn't extradite him for that reason. However, the U.S. government appealed this decision and gave the European, uh, the U.K. High Court what they called assurances that Assange wouldn't be treated quite so poorly in an American prison and that he likely wouldn't be so miserable that he would kill himself. And initially, the U.K. government uh, did accept this, and the U.K. foreign, uh, I think it was a foreign secretary, even supported and signed off on the uh, extradition request to the United States. And so the Assange legal team had a couple last minute uh, arguments that they made to the UK uh, highest court in the past six months. And last month, or maybe it was towards the end of May, actually, the high court ruled uh, in favor of Assange getting a full appeal on the grounds that the Americans had really hurt themselves. And so it, for the UK to extradite somebody to an American court, that person has to have full rights of an American citizen. And so the UK, the U.S. government had previously argued that Assange didn't have First Amendment rights because he wasn't an American citizen, but now this put him in a bind because he either has to have First Amendment rights or the U.K. won't extradite him because he can't be extradited to the U.S. if he has uh, doesn't have rights that other Americans would have. And so it looked like maybe the U.K. court was actually going to rule against the U.S., and that's when they cut this plea deal. Okay, and so as part of the deal, correct me if I'm wrong, Assange did agree that he violated the Espionage Act, but maintained, I still think what I did was covered by the First Amendment, and I just, but I acknowledge, you know, reading the statute, I violated the Espionage Act, and I just think that those two are, are inconsistent, that the First Amendment and the Espionage Act don't, don't go together. Is, it, is that right? Right, yeah, and he only pled guilty to one count of violating the espionage ad, so they dropped the other 17. It was prearranged that he would uh, be sentenced to 62 months in prison, which is how long he was in Belmarsh, so, uh, and that he would just get time served and then be able to travel again from the northern Morena Islands, which is apparently the furthest U.S. courtroom from Washington, D.C., uh, and then he would be able to go back to his native Australia. And in court, it seemed like he did something that if it was, uh, I guess, any a more familiar courtroom, we call it maybe an Alfred plea, where he basically said that I don't think I'm guilty, but because of how I would have to defend myself, I would be convicted. Because the Espionage Act does not allow you uh, to make First Amendment arguments, you can't say that I published these documents because it was exposing war crimes and it was the benefit of the American people to know. All that happens in the courtroom is they say, did you do it? And if you say yes, you're convicted. And so Assange basically said, because I would have to fight in this courtroom with one hand tied me behind my back, I would be convicted. And so I'll plead guilty on those grounds. Okay. So just in terms of the timeline, he left the UK prison and then went to that distant, that was technically US territory? Yeah, it's way out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh -huh. uh, the Northern Mariana Islands. I actually had to look it up to see where it was. And, it, you know, if you just look at a map of the Pacific Ocean, the blue completely washes out the green in that area. So this is a pretty small uh, little area that the U.S. has a district court, apparently. And so, yeah, Assange traveled dr essentially directly from the U.K. to that territory. I think the plane made one stop in Bangkok. And then he was only on the ground, I would say, six, maybe eight hours before he was then taking off for Australia. Okay, so he had to go there because in a U.S. court, he had to officially enter his plea. That was the reason for all that stuff? Okay. 
Yeah. Which I mean, seems a little silly after four years of COVID where I'm sure they would have just done this remotely. Right. Uh, right. But uh, I guess we had to pretend and do the ceremony where the judges put on the robes and everything. Okay. Um, not that it's a huge deal, but do you, do you have any insight into the, like that he had to pay $525,000 or something for the jet? Yeah. So apparently it was a Australian government chartered flight and I know from just past experience, I've talked to people who have taken uh, took in like chartered flights from governments before, and they're always extremely expensive. Even if it's, you know, just a, a short international trip, it's going to be tens of thousands of dollars. So I, I wasn't necessarily surprised at the same time. You would think the Australian government would have just eaten the cost or, or something like that. Uh, but they did send Assange a bill and apparently some very generous Bitcoiner uh, donated a Bitcoin to cover it. Okay. But, but do you know, like, was that his only option? You know what I mean? Like, do they say, yeah, you, you have to take this flight. And by the way, the bill's 525,000. So my guess is this wasn't the only option that if Assange was like, well, all I could afford is a, you know, whatever air ticket and, and flew public that wouldn't have been something the U S would have said he can't do. My guess is that the Assange team wanted it done this way because they were afraid that he would be arrested uh, by the United States somewhere along the line. My understanding is there were Australian representatives with him the entire way to uh, assure Assange and his team that he would not be arrested by the Americans. Okay. So that raises the question for me. And I saw like, like he got a hero's welcome back home, right? That it's, it's not that people were embarrassed like oh yeah here's our black sheep causing trouble that the, like do, do you know like did the australian people in general favor assange this whole time i don't know about this whole time but political pressure from the australian people has mounted on their government and the current australian prime minister was actually somebody who was interested in freeing assange and it was probably the pressure that he put on the biden administration that was you know the final straw that broke the camel's back on all of this so I, I think, again, I don't want to just generalize and say that he's universally popular in mm. Australia, but he at least had enough diehard supporters that were willing to go out there, pound the pavement, and made sure that their political leaders would advocate for this to the Americans. Just a few months ago, there was a delegation from Australia, and I think they represent every party uh, that has, holds a legislative seat in Australia actually came to the U S to meet with American lawmakers on this. So it really was kind of a, a cross political effort from the U uh, from Australia to get this done. Okay. Um, so as far as what the deal was like, so from the Biden administration's point of view, they can say that they dealt with the problem, this mounting awkwardness and people were thinking, yeah, this guy just keeping him up, hold up indefinitely. That's not good for anybody. You got to get, get him out. But they didn't like drop the charges or pardon him or anything. It was that, no, he, he agreed. He did something wrong, but they, you know, sentenced to time served. So they, they can kind of say, we didn't just let him off. You know, we punished him. He, Hey, he spent five years. Like that's, that should be a deterrent to other people thinking about publishing our secrets that, you know, you don't want to throw away five years of your life. Um, but yet they still got him out. And so he like, they're trying to thread that needle presumably is to appease the anti-war activists left who w would like us, you know, they like Assange being freed, but also, you know, to placate some of the hardliners to say, we didn't just let him off scot-free. You know, he's, he was in prison for five years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're writing the state department uh, bullet points here, Bob, but that's essentially what the state department came out and said that we felt like he did his time, uh, that mm -hmm. he served an appropriate punishment for the crime that he committed. And so we are happy with the results. I think the U.S. government also was a little bit worried about losing in the U.K. courtroom. And so this, you know, kind of satisfied that issue as well, that they took mm -hmm. this off of the table in the election year. Uh, you, you know, if the U.K. court kicked this down the road another two or three months, then we're really talking about this being a major issue as the election is nearing. So it kind of takes Assange off the table, and mm -hmm. at least it's not going to be a problem for, for him from his progressive base on this particular issue, although he's alienated those pretty people pretty well with his uh, Israel policy. Sure, sure. So can you speak to th that? You know, that? This is where I want to go next with this. Do you have any sense of, um, like, for example, as I'm sure you know, some— American-based 
libertarian party people like with a capital L think that, oh, maybe some of this timing has to do with the fact that Trump just came to the libertarian party's uh, convention and at least paid lip service to the idea that, hey, if I get reelected, I'm going to pardon uh, Snowden and so forth. Or, um, yes, yeah, is, is that who he said he was going to pardon? Now I'm getting mixed I up. I think at the LP he said Ross, but said then Ross. I think yeah. uh, like a day later he told Tim Pool Assange as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So who knows if Trump just yeah. doesn't know the difference between the, between the two men either. No, yeah, so it, Ross, Ross is the one that I, I had in mind. And then, and so that sort of kicked up a campaign and then people somewhat tongue-in-cheek on Twitter were tweeting at President Biden with those you know news stories of that and saying, hey, why don't you jump the gun and really stick it to Trump and why don't you pardon Ross first you know, before he gets a chance? To, so then now this thing happens with Assange and some people were wondering, are those two connected? Do you, do you have any sense of what, whether, does this have anything to do with U.S. domestic politics or do you think this was just a separate track? So, uh, you know, I think this does play a part. I think the political pressure on the Biden administration here, and not just from the libertarians, I think most people in the U.S. who are big supporters of Assange are typically from the far further leftern half of the political spectrum, not necessarily talking about AOC, but people who we principally called anti-war and things like that are huge advocates of Assange. But I do think the Libertarian Party, and a part of this, I guess, is confirmed because Stella Assange personally thanked the Libertarian mm-hmm. Party uh, for their role in all of this. But I, I do think the Libertarian Party convention provided a little bit of a networking opportunity for the Assange team. His brother, Gabriel Shimpton, was there. I think he met both with RFK Jr. and his running mate, Nicole Shanahan. I'm not sure if he personally met with uh, Trump himself. I, I think I saw a picture of him with Thomas Massey, and he also did quite a few other events while he was in Washington, D.C. And so I, I think this probably intermingling of the Assange team with uh, people inside of the swamp certainly didn't help or didn't hurt at all right. uh, him getting ultimately released here. And, and I'm sure played a minor role, but some role in, in all of this. Okay, and then I guess the last thing we can talk about here is what what's the net effect of all this like on uh, journalists whether they're you know of- official ones that would do that would be recognized by the state department down to you know guerrilla journalists that are just you know guys with twitter accounts and youtube channels and whatnot uh wh- what's the the net takeaway from this that uh i saw you quoted somebody saying look the fact that I, I guess some people were worried that, oh, Assange, you shouldn't have pled guilty to that because now you sort of admitted that you did something wrong and this is going to come down on the rest of us. But And I saw you quoted, like, I forget if it was a law professor, would say, no, the fact that he pled guilty, that, does, that doesn't mean anything. That's not, that doesn't make it harder. It doesn't affect the, the prospects for future journalists in this kind of situation one way or the other. Do, do I have that right? Right. So, yeah, I think legally this really doesn't, set a precedent for other journalists to now be tried and convicted under the Espionage Act. My understanding, and I'm not a lawyer, is that a plea agreement, uh, and and this is what constitutional lawyer Bruce Afrin said, uh, is different than an establishment of fads and and then a ruling from there. And so in this way, it it doesn't set that precedent. However, I, I think the precedent it does set is that if you publish things that really embarrass the American empire, we will ruin your life. I mean, you know, Assange for years was labeled as a rapist. And then when he was in the Ecuadorian embassy, they spied on him 24-7. They constantly smeared him. They, you know, claimed he was going crazy uh, because he was riding skateboards up and down the hallways of the Ecuadorian embassy. Apparently, that was because he hadn't been in a car for so long that he just wanted to feel like kind of a motion and to move without walking. And so he would like kind of roll up and down the hallways on a skateboard. They claimed he was doing disgusting things like leaving food out for several days in a row. It turned out he was making bone broth because it had an autoimmune disorder. And so they, you know, they just constantly lied about this guy, uh, smeared him. You know, he never got to, uh, I guess, Wednesday was the first day he was able to embrace his wife as a free man and his children as well. So they really turned his life upside down and really hampered 
WikiLeaks. Uh, you know, when I talk to my fellow, you know, kind of Assange advocates all these years, one of the things we would always talk about is not just that Assange is in jail and this is attack on the First Amendment, it's that WikiLeaks, one of, if not the most important outlet uh, you know, in the internet age of journalism has effectively been neutered. I mean, at least when he was in the Ecuadorian embassy, WikiLeaks did do some important work. One of it was uh, they got some documents from people within the International Chemical Weapons Watchdog, the OPCW, and published those. And that helped to avert a larger American war in uh, Syria because uh, there were people claiming Assad, Assad used chemical weapons and these documents debunked those. And so, they really effectively stopped WikiLeaks once they put Assange in the Belmarsh prison. And so I think in that way, too, they set a very dangerous precedent that they can go ahead and, and turn lives upside down, ruin outlets and things like that, even if it's just for a limited period of time. And even if they don't get the big conviction they want at the end and Assange just spends the rest of his life in prison, they certainly were able to get through a lot. I imagine WikiLeaks probably would have published a lot of documents about all the corruption going on during the war in Ukraine or maybe evidence of war crimes that Israel is committing in Gaza. Uh, but unfortunately, the outlet just hasn't been in a position to do that. And the world remains in the dark and war crimes go on. Mm -hmm. And also, too, there probably was, as they say, a chilling effect on other people who may have come forward either because they have documents that they wanted or to to distribute things like, you know, to, to be another Assange and then looking what happened to him and saying, no, that looks like the authorities are pretty serious about this. I'm, I'm just going to keep my head down. And so we, you know, we don't, we don't know what would have happened in the alternate timeline of what other things could have been brought to light. But now we're not because too many people saw what happened to Assange and, you know, Manning and Edward Snowden and so forth. Absolutely. Now I just want to kind of add here. I do think it's a huge victory that he is now out of jail if the people did not care in the U.S. and Australia and in the U.K., they would have just extradited him to the United States and he would now be rotting in some American prison after being convicted in some Washington, D.C. courtroom of violating the Espionage Act, locked away for the rest of his life in some dungeon in Colorado. Uh, but now he gets to walk the world a free man. And it goes to show you can have this decentralized, uh, broad political movement that can put a lot of pressure on pow powerful authorities and eventually we can get what we want. Um, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, but at least it is a victory. And now we get a very, very powerful journalist back and hopefully WikiLeaks will again be able to do, uh, you know, the role it was meant to do, which is expose power and corruption. Yeah. And it is just kind of remarkable. I realize this is going to sound very naive, but I mean, like is a little kid, the idea to me that, oh, do you know when you're an adult that around the world people will tremble at the idea of being put into a U.S. prison? You know what I mean? Like when, you, when you're a little kid, that's like, oh, imagine if you got arrested by North Korea or the Soviets or, you know, depending on the time, like, like that, that would be so scary. Or you're, you know, in, I don't know where, some some uh, third world country where they're all in. But no, now it's that, oh, yeah, one of the worst fates would be if you were an enemy of the U.S. government and they got their hands on you. And that's just amazing to me, you know, that from, from what you're taught as a young kid in, in the U S school system about, you know, we're the good guys look at our role in history. Yeah. I, I mean, I was so naive when it came out that they were spying on his private conversations with his lawyers. I thought to myself, oh, that's it. They can't prosecute him now because, you know, <laughs> they've clearly violated his civil rights and they're going to have to drop these charges. Uh, th that's essentially what happened with Daniel Ellsberg, right? Nitsen went too far and they tried to break into, I believe, his psychiatrist's office and steal records that way. And, and and that's the reason why they had to drop the espionage ad charges against him. So I thought something similar would happen here this time. But uh, by that time, what had happened was, and we didn't even talk about this, Assange released the Hillary Clinton emails in 2016 and you, you know, just exposed corruption within the Democratic Party. He didn't ruin Hillary Clinton's chances of getting elected president. The DNC did when they raided the election in favor of Hillary Clinton. Uh, Assange just made those documents public. So by the time 2018, 2019, it's coming out that he was spied on by the CIA when he was having conversations or in intimate moments with his wife. People just didn't care because the Republicans still hated him from back when he embarrassed Bush. And now the Democrats blamed mm -hmm. him for being a traitor to Vladimir and a puppet of Vladimir Putin and serving the interests of evil and took the throne away from its rightful heir, Hillary Clinton.
Actually, yeah, we just in the last few minutes here, can you can you speak to that? I had totally forgotten there was that element as well that yeah, that we I remembered how the you know right wing Republican hawks hated him, but I I forgot about that element where a bunch of people on the left, you know, oh this guy, he you know, he's just doing the bidding of Putin. He's a you know uh, at the very at worst, he's a you know malicious traitor who's seeking to undermine the US people and way of life. And at the very least, you know, he's a useful idiot that thinks he's the hero, but he's deluded and he's just actually doing what Putin wants. So I don't know if there's anything else you want to, can you speak just to that general motif? Yeah. So in 2016, they started to release the DNCCC files. And again, the the main things that they showed were just rampant corruption within the DNC and rigging, uh, passing the debate questions to Hillary Clinton before and making sure that Bernie Sanders wasn't able to win that election. He also released the Podesta files and as well as some of the conspiracy theories that emerged out of there. There were very real conspiracy theories, such as uh, financial institutions picking President Obama's uh, cabinet, and, and we learned that from those emails and, and things like that. So there was a lot of important information there, and this was during the 2016 election. And if you remember back to the time, first they said they were fake, and then when they were real, they said, oh, these came from Russia and Vladimir Putin. And, you know, this was put forward, and really that that's what they said up until Mueller finally admitted. And in his report, he didn't even have any links between the DNC emails in Russia, it's pretty clear there's a, a organization called Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. Uh, it's led by Ray McGovern. There's a lot of very intelligent men and former members of the intelligence community on that board. And what they conclude is that these files weren't actually hacked. They were downloaded from the DNC servers and then linked from there, leaked from there to Julian Assange which would certainly imply it was some kind of staffer who was upset about the election, uh, primary election being stolen from Bernie Sanders. And that's why he gave those emails to uh, Julian Assange. And, and, you know, another important point to all this as well, if there were some of Hillary Clinton's State Department emails uh, in this as well that were leaked. And those included things like, I think it was Sidney Blumenthal telling Hillary Clinton about the war in Libya that uh, Al Qaeda is on our side on this one. And then, of course, we know that Hillary Clinton pushed to move forward with that war. And so they really embarrassed Hillary Clinton and made her out to be a very bad secretary of state. And as Scott Horton always points out, it really shouldn't have been a big deal that her State Department emails were leaked. If she was a good leader, it was shown that she was a good leader. But because she's a corrupt Clinton, it showed that she was a corrupt Clinton. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I do remember like some of the wise guy analysis at the time of people, you know, saying, oh, yeah, Julian Assange's big crime was he was interfering with, you know, an election by telling the American people, like showing them what, what their candidate was like or something like that, you know, like, and, and the Democrats were really upset. How dare you let people know what Hillary Clinton's character is like when they're getting ready to, to vote for her in either a primary or a, a general. So, yeah. Okay, well, I think we got to wrap it up there, Kyle. Is there where would you point people if they want to you know, follow more of your work or just you know read more about this case? Where should they go? Uh, I post I post all my stuff on my Twitter account at Kyle Anslow underscore. I'm the opinion editor at antiwar.com, so I put together the viewpoint section and then we'll write news stories there. I'm also the news editor at the Libertarian Institute, so. If you go to the news section of that website, that's pretty much me every day, just writing up some foreign policy stories. And then I host a show, Conflicts of Interest, with Connor Freeman and Will Porter. Okay, well, great. So, folks, my guest has been Kyle Anzalone. Kyle, thanks so much for your time and your insights. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.